As we close our activities in Ethiopia, Beulah and I are very grateful for this opportunity to share with you some of our experiences, especially activities that Grace Community has supported very generously over the past 20 years. I was privileged to grow up in a pastor's family in Bellingham, where loving God and following Jesus were considered to be the central goals of our lives. As the Old Testament reading this morning urged us to choose life, our family tried to do that with enthusiasm and energy and perseverance. I decided to become a physician when I was 15 years old. A year later, I felt God was leading me to become a medical missionary, and this provided strong motivation and clear objectives from then on, including training in medicine, surgery, and tropical medicine. Uh, <clears throat> seven years of those, many years I spent at the University of Washington, UW. We didn't call it that at that time. I was married during medical school, and our family, including two-year-old Andy, left for Ethiopia in 1957. That's 62 years ago, to work for four years in a 35-bed hospital in a countryside town called Ambo, doing all kinds of medicine and surgery, plus training health personnel. Two daughters, Becky and Mary Lou, joined our family during this time. However, by the third year, while treating many, many patients, I came to believe that it was not enough to treat diseases and take care of medical emergencies or to act as if a future heaven was our only important priority. I wanted to, dis to focus on improving the quality of life at the present time, now, educationally, economically, nutritionally, as well as spiritually. I turned to studies in public health and anthropology in order to have a more strategic and basic approach. Then I felt God was leading me toward teaching at the university level, which I had never even thought about before. I had barely gotten started in advanced studies when I was stunned to be invited to become the head of a new public health college and training center in northern Ethiopia that had major American government support. I would also be responsible for health services for the surrounding two million people. My job included supervising students in practical training in Kosoya community at almost 10,000 feet altitude. During these years, my second son, Steve, was born. I was also required by my role to respond to major drought and famine conditions that hit the area. Severe droughts and famines have been occurring every decade in the Horn of Africa throughout written history. They often have caused profound political turmoil and the toppling of governments, including Emperor Haile Selassie, who was overthrown in 1974 and re <clears throat> replaced by a Marxist military government that was ruthlessly destructive. Jumping ahead a decade to the early 1980s, one of the worst ever famines took place in Ethiopia, where hundreds of thousands of Ethiopians were dying due to lack of food and water. Eventually, more than a million people died. Once the horrifying news was leaked to the global media, the, <clears throat> the Western world was shocked and responded with huge amounts of money and support. I was sent twice uh, by the American Catholic Relief Services to see what could be done in long-term development 
as well as the immediate food and medical relief. Well, my Ethiopian story <laughs> starts when I met Dennis in 1981. I have four sons and didn't want to be with anyone unless they had at least three children. They wouldn't understand me and my relationship to my children. Along comes Dennis with four children of his own, two sons and two daughters. When we met, most of our children were late teens or older. I fell in love and then learned that so much of this man's life had been connected to Ethiopia. In 1986, while we were camping, I had a dream that we were moving to Ethiopia. I shared this with Dennis, and he began to look, but nothing seemed to be available. But as God sometimes provides, a friend of Dennis told him that Save the Children was looking for a medical person to move to Ethiopia for their health program after this 1980s famine. We interviewed in Westport, Connecticut, and they really, really wanted Dennis. They wanted him for his history, his knowledge, and his language knowledge. He said that he wouldn't go unless I was hired professionally as well. They weren't sure what to do with me, a licensed master level social worker as I had never worked in another country. Well, they wanted him so badly that begrudgingly they hired me to be responsible for 87 orphans in the midsection of Ethiopia while Dennis was in charge of the health program for that area. I wanted to move to Ethiopia, but somehow my body froze Yes, froze. I could barely move my legs and my arms, and I could only open my mouth a little bit. I was terrified at an unconscious level. I was leaving my children, my life as I knew it, and setting off to some place totally new. I was choosing a new life. Well, I told my body, I'm sorry, body, but you're going anyway. <laughs> and we went. Save the Children had initiated a program of housing six or eight children in a home with a house mother in a village where they attended the local school and were supposedly integrated into the village. Many villages had two orphan homes. I felt quite overwhelmed. New place, new culture, new people, and 87 children in seven different villages. Thank God there were four very helpful and kind Ethiopians with the orphan program. Most of the villages were a distance from the main road. The villagers lived in either round houses with grass roofs or square houses with tin roofs. The walls are made of eucalyptus poles plastered with what they call chica. Chica is a mix of dirt, straw, water, and cow manure. The floors are smooth with cow manure and water. I had strong feelings that we were in biblical times when I saw these traditional houses, the plowing with two oxen, harvesting with a sickle, thrashing with oxen or horse, and winnowing in a breeze. All the people were friendly, greeting as they passed by in sandals or barefoot, probably walking many, many miles to their destination. I'm going to use the story of Menda Begashaw. Menda was two years old when he joined the program. He was a true orphan, no parents. He did have two sisters, though, and they're in a picture with him. While we, 
I and the four wonderful Ethiopians worked hard over the next two years to reunite the orphans who had family in the countryside. We were able to reduce the program from 87 orphans to 35, 28 boys and seven girls, the oldest being 16 and the youngest four. We taught farming and other useful skills to the orphans, but um, seven more left on their own when it was clear that we were not taking them to the U.S. and we expected them to be farmers. During these eight years, each of our eight children visited us at one time or another, but thoughts and love for our own children became stronger and stronger. And in 1994, we returned to the States, leaving 28 orphans still in the program. In 1998, Dennis and I came back to visit Ethiopia. Much to our chagrin, we found that Save the Children had pulled out of that area. They gave each of the 28 orphans some money and said goodbye. Mende, was 14 at that time. He wanted to continue his school, but was unable to afford it. We learned of seven other boys who also wanted to follow their education. Dennis and I decided to help them, and we started the KEDS program. KEDS means Kids Education and Development Support. One of the previous orphan staff, Deborah Tu, was willing to be the point person to keep track and to help with distribu distributing funds for these kids. While still in school, each child was given the large amount of $25 a month to provide all their needs. And somehow they managed even saving some and helping others. Any who went on to post high school were helped with 12 50 a month. The KEDS program ended up helping 14 orphans complete their education, 10 males and 4 females. Menda decided that he wanted to go into agriculture and get a degree so that he would teach others. He is successful in his occupation and is now married with two children. There's a photo of Mendy in when he was 16 serving me dinner, which he had prepared. KED's program helped all the boys through their schooling get responsible jobs, such as running non-government organizations, being directors of schools, policemen, teachers, and agriculture. Most have married and have children. The women have had a more difficult time due to the nature of the patriarchal society of Ethiopia. A few were married and then lost their husband and children through AIDS, through lots of help from many of you. Four have their own home and e they even rent out parts of it. Through all the major kids program, Grace Church was financially and emotionally supportive. And there was much support from many of you, particularly those who adopted one of the orphans. We have great appreciation for the great help and interest from Grace. After working with Save the Children for eight years, <clears throat> Buell and I returned to the U.S. in 1994. I began working with the Jimmy Carter Center in Atlanta to help establish seven new university health science faculties in Ethiopia <clears throat> under the new regime that had come to power. In addition, my historian son Andy and I agreed that we should write a book Many of you know this book that we've had around for a few years, uh, <clears throat> uh, telling how the countryside people in Kosoye managed to survive the terrible conditions of war and famine during the previous regime. When the research for the book was completed, we decided to develop a small health demonstration project in Kosoye for two or three years as a kind of moral debt repayment to the villagers for their willingness to tell their stories to us, which we published in book form, we targeted 
five major health problems that were common in Kosoye, including malnutrition and four infectious diseases. We formed an organization, the Kosoye Project, which became a nonprofit charity with Dennis as the director, Andy, his son, the associate director, and I became the treasurer and secretary. We had established a small program with 12 community health workers teaching local people during coffee ceremony time on how to use various methods to have healthy children, including how to grow vegetables and cook them. Ethiopian standard cooking is to use oil, garlic, and onions with most foods. After the community health worker had demonstrated the cooking of chard over a three stone fire in a local home, a woman, Addis, spoke up and said that she did not have money for onions, garlic, and oil. But when she cooked the chard she had grown just with water, it tasted so good. Using good statistical evaluation, after two years, we found that there had been remarkable progress with the communicable diseases like trachoma and diarrhea. However, serious malnutrition continued to get worse. In consultation with Gondor University, we radically changed our act up objectives. Now we would concentrate our efforts almost entirely on improving family nutrition by growing vegetables with high uh, vitamin A content, such as carrots, chard, and kale, that promote body systems growth and maintenance beginning from conception through old age. Because lack of vitamin A was damaging the health of nearly everyone, but especially women and children. The spreading of the new gardening practices by personal contact was too slow to reach the thousands of families that needed better nutrition. So we began collaborating with the elementary school system, training teachers to train their students how to garden and giving the students seeds and their new skills to take home to their families to start their own family gardens. This worked wonderfully well. Soon hundreds of households across the countryside were growing vegetables to eat and some to sell as well. Our underlying goal was always to make sure that everything would be sustainable and contain, continue when we left the program sometime in the future. We taught people how to produce seeds and established seed banks and we bought the seeds produced locally and gave them to students and community leaders. Nearly everyone was very enthusiastic about the new nutritious vegetables, including the Gonder University president, who persuaded us, twisted our arms to expand the program to the five million people struggling to live in the surrounding area. The gardening program grew much faster than we had ever dreamed or envisioned. We often sensed God's providential presence. The nine other universities in the Amhara region heard about these successes and insisted on having their own programs in their own localities. We oriented these other university people, demonstrated the skills, and taught representatives how to establish gardens. We gave them seeds and help getting them started. Eight of the 10 regional universities now have their own active programs of spreading household gardening into rural communities. These efforts have been so successful and popular that the universities declared publicly this past May that they should take full responsibility to manage and expand their programs. This, of course, was our goal all along. This past June 22nd, the Kasoye Board decided that we should hand over the responsibilities to the universities themselves. This was especially in the light of uh, chaotic political goings on. 
as well as increasing violence in, in the countryside and in the cities as the country prepares for elections next year. The Kosoya program is now completely closed. We hope for its continuing sec, uh, success. Life and health depend on it for millions of people. And I would just mention in passing that you are all invited to an event on September 21st at the home of uh, David and Joyce Veteranis. Um, our son Andy will be out with uh, more pictures and an analysis of what happened through the years. Uh, so if you have the um, table out front, you take one of these inv invitations. We all also have copies of the last two uh, newsletters, the final update, as well as the one just before that, and you're welcome to have those. Over 14 years, two million seed packets were distributed. 10,000 school teachers were trained in vegetable gardening, making neat rows, mulching, and composting, and training their students. Already, eight regional universities have started similar programs, and all 10 universities in the Amhara region want to take over and be responsible for what has been begun by our very small Kasoye program. As these 10 universities develop their own programs, they will potentially have deep impact on the 36 million people living in this north central region of Ethiopia. Our immense thanks to Grace Church and the wonderful, generous members of Grace Community who have supported the program over these many years. Music